Today, I want to go deeper into where is all of this leading. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives signs of the last days. Now, you have to understand that when we speak in biblical terms, from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost, When the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2, you must understand that all from that time period until the present day, the Bible speaks as the last days. Okay? If that is true, that the last days span all the way back 2,000 years ago to the Bible days, then that must mean that we are in truly the last of the last days. It must mean that we are in the last hours of the last days. Now, most generations have thought this. You know, I asked the Lord at one time, I didn't understand, and I said, Lord, why would you lead every generation of the church to believe that you are coming for them And that they are the last generation. I didn't understand. I said, Lord, you know, why why did you not say in the scriptures, uh, I am coming, but it's going to be a couple thousand years? Why wouldn't you just say that? And the Lord took me to 1 John 3, where it says that everyone who hopes in his coming thus purifies himself. Do you know what the purpose of prophecy is? It's not to speculate. It's not to preoccupy our thoughts with, oh, who is the Antichrist? What will be the mark of the beast? How will we know? What are we necessarily watching for? It is not to get entangled in speculations. Do you know the purpose, the biblical purpose of prophecy? It's to purify your life. It's to be longing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to live every day as though Christ may come at any moment. Amen. And those who live a life like that, You don't get entangled in worldly things. As we said last week, you do not get distracted with our phones and our tablets. No, you look up and there's an anticipation about you. There is a purification. There is a soberness to you. There is a weightiness that We are in the last days and Christ is coming soon. I better do all I can to win my family to the Lord. That's how the Lord wants us to live in this hour. So I want to go deeper today into where is all of this leading. And in Matthew chapter 24, Christ gives us many signs that we ought to look for. I'm going to ask you to go today to Ezekiel 38 because... In Matthew 24, one of the sure signs that Christ gives us is war. As a matter of fact, the way that Christ describes it is that in the last days, there are going to be what he calls labor pains, birth pains. Now, you know, we've just had all kinds of babies born into the church. What's our last count? Nine? Something like that. 13 or 14 babies born recently. We're looking for nursery help. If you could sign up today, that would be amazing. Lots of babies being born in our church right now. Aren't we thankful for that? Y'all don't need to come to marriage conference. Y'all need to... Anyways. We're thankful for all the babies being born How many of you know it's not necessarily contractions that you look for when you're about to go into labor? Because how many of you mothers rushed 
to the hospital on your first contraction or two and they sent you home? How many had Braxton Hicks contractions? It's not necessarily the contraction, but what do the doctors tell you? You're looking for frequency and intensity. So what happens is scoffers will look at the words of Jesus when Jesus said there are going to be earthquakes in various places and there's going to be pestilence, disease, uh, hello, COVID-19. And there's going to be famine in various places. And there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And a scoffer will look at that and they'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's always been those things. But it's not the contraction we're looking at. What we're looking at as students of the Bible, as Christ followers, we're looking for frequency. Oh and intensity. And would you agree or disagree? There is a different level of intensity on the earth today, unlike anything in our lifetimes. So Jesus makes it clear that one of the signs that's going to mark the last days is war. World War I, which was in the early 1900s was followed by the Spanish influenza, which then was followed later by the Great Depression and then, of course, World War II. More people died in World War II than in any conflict in human history. And if you're wise, you understand that history repeats itself. What is coming is war. And many of us are feeling the winds of war today like never before. What is, where is all of this leading? Jesus said, the last days, nation would rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There would be war and rumors of war. Now let's go to Ezekiel 38. There is a war coming in the last days that my aim today, remember last week was called discerning the times. If you can understand Israel's past, you can understand the present, you will then know the future. That was the goal of last week, discerning the times. The goal of this week is to explain the days to come. There is going to be a war that is going to happen. Most scholars agree, and I hold to this view, most agree that this war described in Ezekiel 38, focusing on Israel, is going to happen in the first half of the tribulation period. For those who perhaps you're not familiar with the tribulation period, that is a seven year period described in the Bible. And do you realize that the Bible records more information about this future seven-year period than any other time period? It's fascinating what all it tells us. And the seven-year tribulation period begins in Revelation chapter 6 with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is what we so often call them. And then it runs all the way to Revelation chapter 19. And in the seven-year tribulation period, there are three sets of judgment upon the earth. There are what's called the seal judgments, which Christ will initiate when he breaks the seal of the scroll in Revelation 5. What's that scroll? We believe it's the inheritance of the earth because in Bible days, a will or an inheritance was sealed seven times. And Christ will break each seal which triggers a judgment upon the earth. 
The second set of judgments are called the trumpet judgments. And the third set is called the bowl judgments. Well, the seal judgments will mark the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Things will greatly and uh, things will ramp up. They will, the state of the earth will deteriorate tremendously and it will escalate the last three and a half years. Now, the first three and a half years, the Antichrist will not have complete and total dominance of the earth. Scripture teaches that there are going to be four power blocks in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. There's going to be what it calls the kings of the south, which will be that Egypt, that Sudan area. It will be the kings of the west, which most likely will be European. It will be the king to the north, who I'm going to argue and show you today why I believe that's Russia. And then the kings of the east, which I believe will be China. What we're going to see in Ezekiel chapter 38 today is incredibly specific. So specific that you and I are watching it unfold right now before our very eyes. And as we do this, uh, we'll call this an intelligence briefing from the prophet Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel rather, excuse me, from the prophet Ezekiel. And here's what you need to understand as we lay out the specifics today of Ezekiel 38. He wrote this 2,600 years ago. There is no way, humanly speaking, that Ezekiel would have known this apart from the Spirit of God. But see, here's the thing, church. God loves prophecy. Do you know why God loves prophecy? Because he says in Isaiah that God declares the end from the beginning. Only a God who is sovereign, only a God who is in complete control, only a God who has all power and all knowledge can declare human history from the ending to the beginning. And that's the purpose of prophecy. It is to show the sovereignty of God. And God wants you to see that today. And you know what happens when the children of God see the sovereignty of God in prophecy? It removes the fear. So today, if you're anxious, if you're concerned, if you're worried about the days to come, you need to understand you are children of the day, not children of the night. And God has all of this already worked out. Amen. <laughs> As we said last week, when things are falling apart, they're falling into place biblically. So Ezekiel chapter 38. Let's look. This war, I believe, happens in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Okay. I'm going to show you in a moment where we are in your Bible. You ever, I remember when I had eyesight, you know, you go to a large uh, mall and they would have this massive map with this big red dot. You are here. We're going to do that with the Bible today. You are here right now, okay? We'll understand where we are in God's prophetic calendar. And in the scriptures. But first, I want you to see how specific and where all this is leading. If you're going to take notes, I want you to note this. You need to understand that God is setting the stage for the Ezekiel 38 war. God is setting the stage for the Ezekiel 38 war. If you'll look at it with me in verses 1 to 6, of Ezekiel 38. And as a matter of fact, before you even look at that, just note this. We're not going to go back and read it, but note this. In Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel sees the valley of dry bones. You remember that incredible chapter? God says, prophesy to the bones, 
the bones come together, the muscles come onto the bones, the skin comes onto the bones, but yet there is no breath in them, right? And God says, prophesy to the breath, and breath comes into them, amen. And then God tells us the meaning of the prophecy. It is speaking of the house of Israel. Fascinating. And God teaches, he says throughout Ezekiel 37 and 38, God is going to bring Israel back into their homeland once again. And I cannot emphasize it strong enough how much prophecy was fulfilled on May 14th, 1948, when Israel was reborn. At that very moment, God's prophetic clock began to tick once again. And something significant happened in global history. And if Ezekiel 37 is about the house of Israel coming back into life, in Isaiah 66, 8, the nation would be reborn in one day. And we watched that happen. It happened within our lifetime. And as we march our way to Ezekiel 38, understand what's happening. Verses 1 through 6 gives a coalition. It gives a confederacy of nations. Now, these were the ancient names 2,600 years ago. And the names have changed many times throughout history. But we know the geography. And we know the linguistic history. And we know the people groups that it speaks of. You can do your own homework on this, and I encourage you to. Some of my favorite people I read after is Mark Hitchcock, David Jeremiah. I trust their voices very much. Chuck Misler, who is now with the Lord. Jack Hibbs. I encourage you to do your own homework on this. But briefly, let me explain to you what I believe is happening and how the stage is being set. Verses 1 to 6 explain nine nations or nine territories. A few of these areas are within Turkey. I believe three of them of the nine, so six other nations. With a prince or a leader or a chief. This name in Ezekiel 38 given to this man is Gog. Now, why Gog? Well, this would have been an ancient title here that to help us just understand, you, it's the way we use the word Pharaoh, okay? Or the way we would use the word czar, or the way we would say president. So this leader, this prince, his name is, or at least his title is Gog, which He is going to lead this group of nations. And watch who the nations are. We know Persia is Iran. Iran was called Persia until 1935. And you need to know this. There are 30 references to Persia in the Old Testament alone. 30. 30 references to the people of Iran. I shared briefly last week, you remember when Daniel prayed in Daniel 10 and his prayers were delayed and there was warfare, angelic warfare going on in the heavens. Do you remember who delayed the prayers? It was the prince, the principality of Persia. And I believe that spirit is alive and well and wreaking havoc right now. It's also important to understand, church, that when you and I are watching governments that we are deeply concerned about, it is so important within the kingdom of God that you distinguish the people from the government. Let me tell you right now, there are untold numbers 
of born again believers in the nation of Iran. Untold Oh, I cannot even wrap my head around how many underground churches and Christians there are right now among those precious people. And you and I should be praying for them. We should be interceding for our brothers and sisters who speak Farsi and who live in a complete different culture than what we do, but yet they love the Lord Jesus Christ just as we do. Can we say amen today? Iran is going to be a major player in this Ezekiel 38 war. And what are we seeing right now? We're watching Iran and Russia join forces like never before. How many drones is Iran supplying to Russia right now for their war in the Ukraine? Persia, Iran, it was called Persia till 1935. It was called the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979. And it's been in the grip of this regime since. They are going to be a major player in end time prophecy. Now we know that Hamas and Hezbollah are proxies of Iran. We know that. In 2006, I had the opportunity to go to Beirut. They drove me through a Hezbollah camp. And I cannot explain to you the evil that I felt. Hundreds and hundreds of tents as far as I could see. The airport was just bombed days before I got there. Tanks, barbed wire everywhere. It, I felt like I was on the set of a movie. My friend who hosted me in Beirut, he kept an American flag on the top of his Jeep. And I asked him, I said, why do you keep that like that? And he said, so when Israel flies over my home, they don't bomb us. Wow. We know that Hezbollah is backed by Iran. We know that Russia has just told Hezbollah that they're going to help them. We know that Hamas has already sent a delegation to Moscow. And we know all of this is coming from Iran. Friends, read Ezekiel 38. Now, Iran is going to be one of the heftiest players in end time prophecy. Is it any coincidence to you at all that Iran dominates our news today? When I say that your Bible is more current than tomorrow's headlines, I'm not kidding. The other players that are interesting is it mentions the ancient names, but again, do your own research in this. It mentions the nations of Central Asia, which are the footsteps of the old Soviet Union. Kazakhstan could include Afghanistan. All of these blocks of nations, which is called Magog, is the ancient title. They are all Islamic states. Very significant. To the far south, it mentions Sudan. And Ethiopia. I did not realize this until prepping for this today that Sudan welcomed Osama bin Laden for a number of years and became a safe haven for he and all of his terrorists. Of course, Sudan went through a terrible civil war, and I was in Sudan a number of years ago, maybe 2009, I believe. I was in both Ethiopia and Sudan. We have preached to many, many Sudanese refugees in Cairo because that nation has been ripped apart. They will be a big player in end-time prophecy. <laughs> to the far west of Israel, it mentions Libya. Libya, as you know, went through the Arab Spring and is in complete disarray. Russia 
right now is trying to gain significant influence in Libya, and they have it. They will be a big player. The other tremendous player is going to be Turkey. Now, you and I need to really pay attention to Turkey. Turkey is who I'm most fascinated with in this list. Because if you understand a little bit about Turkey, here's what, here's what you need to know about that nation. Again, I cannot emphasize enough. There are many, many born-again people in Turkey. I have a dear friend who is a pastor in Turkey. And they have to be so careful. They are under such restrictions of the government. It is a deeply persecuted land. Erdogan, who is their president, who did a coup some years ago, has complete power of that country. And here's what I want you to know about Turkey, because again, this fulfills Ezekiel 38. If you pay attention to verses 1 through 6, it tells us these players. Gomer, Beth, uh, I, oh, it's slipping my mind. Read it. for Do, do your homework on this. I can't remember, Put Kush, I can't remember all of the ancient names. But three of these involve the nation of Turkey. Now, what's significant about Turkey? What is significant is that Turkey, let me give you a good example. How many of you live in the Bristol area? I know several have come to our church from Bristol. Uh, as you know, Bristol lies on the border of both Tennessee and Virginia, Right? So it's very interesting. You be on one side of the street, you're in Virginia. You cross the street, you're in Tennessee. And so you get two different tax rates, right? It's very interesting. We know a little bit about that in Bristol. Well, did you know Istanbul in Turkey is the only major city of the world that lies on both the European and the Asian continent? And so there's this identity question in Turkey of who are they? Are they European or are they Islamic? Erdogan is a radical Muslim. What is interesting is even though Turkey is part of NATO, what they have not been able to successfully do through the last several decades, they cannot track into the European Union. Now, why would we care? i tell you why we should care. It's because what that is doing is it is pushing Turkey back to their Islamic roots. Why is that significant? Because Turkey will be a major player in the Ezekiel 38 war. And so what are we watching right now in our headlines? We're watching Iran. We're watching Turkey. We're watching Libya, Sudan. And then who is the last major player here? Russia. If you note Ezekiel 38 verse 12... Now, you need to understand this as a Christ follower. God calls Israel, look at verse 12, the last phrase. God calls Israel the center of the earth. Isn't it interesting that if you unfold a map today, Israel is quite literally the center of the earth? How did Ezekiel know that? He didn't apart from the Spirit of God. Now, if you note verse 15, I want you to watch this. It talks about the leader of this group being to the utter or the extreme north. Do you know what is north of Israel? Five nations. Syria. Lebanon. Turkey, Ukraine, and Russia. Russia is to their extreme north. Moscow is right above Jerusalem to the far north. Friends, this is speaking of Russia. 
they are going to lead this great end time war. So when you're listening to the news or you're reading the news and you're watching the activity between Moscow and Tehran, it ought to excite you beyond belief that the Bible is happening right before your very eyes. And what are they going to do? They're going to invade Israel. I have a website that many of you may not know about because I've not talked about it in quite some time. But the website is called Russia'sEndgame.com. And I would encourage you to listen to my talk there. Russia'sEndgame.com. When Russia invaded Ukraine, what is their endgame? What is the overall reasoning for invading Ukraine? Putin may have a number of reasons, but let me tell you the real biblical, spiritual warfare reason of what's going on. They want Israel. And what we are going to see happen is we are going to see at some point this coalition come together to come against the nation of Israel. Now, the question is, when? Let me give you two possibilities of what we may see happen. Number one, I want you to note this. There is a war mentioned in Isaiah, I'm sorry, in Psalms 83. Now, you should go back and read Psalms 83. It is a fascinating chapter. Most Bible scholars do not believe <clears throat> that that is a war that could possibly precede the Magog War of Ezekiel 38. I would agree with that until October 7th. One of the biggest questions of Ezekiel 38 is why does it mention these nations in particular, but who it does not mention are the obvious players like Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. Why does it not mention those very obvious nations? There is a possibility, two possibilities, excuse me. So if you're going to take notes, note the one possibility. One possibility is that the Psalm 83 war in which Israel is greatly attacked, God comes to their rescue, and Israel goes on the offensive, and God gives them a great victory. We could be watching that play out right now before our eyes. And it could be that Israel emerges as such a military might in the region that all these other nations back off. That's a possibility. It could happen. The second possibility, why these nations are not mentioned is because in Ezekiel 38, after naming all the other nations, what does it mention? It mentions many others are with them. The more likely scenario that I hold to of what's going on is what God is showing us is the outer perimeter of Israel's enemies. And then assuming that the inner perimeter are going to be on the attack as well. But given what happened October 7th, if you go home and you read Psalm 83, it is pretty striking. And I think what we are going to see, you know, I heard an Israeli official say, and I thought this was very strong. They said, the world supports Israel as a victim, but will the world support Israel when we become the victors? I heard another Israeli official say concerning the UN's condemnation of them. I heard another official say they would rather the world condemn an alive Israel than console a dead Israel. 
Friends, the stakes are very high. I heard Benjamin Netanyahu say days after October 7th, and I thought it was quite fitting the way that he said this. He said, you have to ask yourself, why is Israel at peace with the Egyptians? And why are they at peace with the Jordanians? Why are they at peace with United Arab Emirates? Why are they at peace with Qatar? But yet they're not at peace with the Palestinians. And nearly at peace with the Saudi Arabians. And Netanyahu said it so well. He said the reason there is not peace with the Palestinians is because it is not that they want peace with Israel. They want peace with no Israel whatsoever. And you can't negotiate with that. You can't. What can you do with that? And so now we see Israel on the attack. And what will that spill over into? We don't know yet. But I think Psalm 83 is a striking psalm when you consider October 7th. But I think the most likely scenario is that what Scripture is trying to show us is this outer perimeter, Russia to the far north, Libya to the far west, the former Soviet bloc, the, all the stands, <laughs> those nations to the far east, and then, of course, Sudan to the far south. It's showing the outer perimeter of Israel's enemies. I think assuming the inner perimeter and what we will begin to see. Now, what I also find interesting is verse number 13. Look at verse 13 with me. Now, we've understood the players. I want you to understand this. There is what appears to me as a weak protest in verse 13. Three nations are going to protest. These nations, the first two, can be described as the Gulf states. Qatar, Baran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, these are the Gulf states. This is where these peoples come from. It is interesting to me that look how the government of Qatar is trying to be right between Hamas and Israel and the United States trying to negotiate. Look what they did with Afghanistan. But here's what I find highly interesting. Tarshish, which is most likely, scholars believe, to the far west, either Spain, perhaps England. These nations give a very weak protest to this war. They're saying, can you really execute what you're wanting to do? Is this really going to work? In other words, they're standoffish about it. What some scholars believe, and I think this is very interesting, if Tarshish does include what many believe would be England, then that would be symbolic to the Western culture, which would be the United States, which would be Australia, New Zealand. So the question comes into play, and this is what I want to ask right now. Where exactly is America in end times prophecy? Where do we stand in all of this? Can you ever imagine a day that our nation does not stand with Israel? I can, unfortunately. And scripture does teach that in the last days, Israel will stand alone. How is it that we would ever turn our backs on Israel? Let me give two possible scenarios. I believe that America at some point will abandon Israel because it will fulfill prophecy. Because we are either unwilling to help them, number one, 
or because we are unable to help them, number two. Now, why would we ever be unwilling? I believe that the pressure is going to continue to mount. And I don't know what this current administration will end up doing. Right now, thank the Lord, they have been very supportive. But the question is, will that continue as pressure mounts and election season draws close? Time will tell. But let me tell you a scenario that I could see happening. You know how much money and resources we are pouring into the Ukrainian conflict with Russia. You know how much money and resources it is going to take for Israel. It is not going to be long, I don't believe, that we'll see China invade Taiwan. And let me say this, you watch, you watch, just as Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Palestine are proxies of Iran, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are proxies of China. And you watch, it's going to have their fingerprints all over it. Now, again, you and I must make the distinction between the people and between the governments. Do you have any concept how many underground churches there are in China right now? China is exploding with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for it. Amen. <clears throat> so what you and I have to be so careful to do you and I have to pray for our brothers and sisters all throughout Russia and all throughout the former Soviet bloc. You and I must pray for our brothers and sisters in China and throughout all the Orient. We must pray for our brothers and sisters in Iran and throughout all of the Middle East. Amen. We cannot forget those in the crossfire of all of this. And most, we must pray for our Palestinian brothers and sisters who are truly in the crossfire of what is happening in the world right now. So we're watching these things unfold. If China were to invade Taiwan, can you imagine how that will stretch us beyond belief? There's one other serious scenario I could see taking place. I'm not asking your opinion. I, I'll talk politics with you all day long, but I'm not going to do it in the pulpit. But you come to me privately, I'll take you out for coffee, and I'll talk to you all day long. <laughs> but no one can deny our border's been wide open. And no one can deny that we have no idea what's coming through our border. You take the strain of Ukraine and Israel and the potential threat of Taiwan, and then you let a major terrorist attack happen on our soil, that's when I could see America saying, Israel, you're on your own. Our hands are tied. Either we will be unwilling, or two, we will be unable. Now, why would we be unable? Because, friends, let me tell you where ultimately all of this is leading. It is leading to the rapture of the church. That's where it's leading. And you know, should the rapture of the church take place, can you imagine, listen, America has so many faults. Yes, we do. We have so many sins. Yes, we do. But do you know how many born again people there are in the United States of America? And can you imagine what it would do to the society? Can you imagine what it would do to the economy when all of those who are born again are taken by the Lord? Oh, America will simply be irrelevant on the global stage when that event happens. So where is all of this leading? It's leading to war. But here's what I want to show you today. If it is true what so many students of the Bible believe. If it is true that this Magog war of Ezekiel 38 will take place in the first 
three and a half years of tribulation and what's going to happen when God comes to defend Israel and he utterly destroys these armies during the first three and a half years. It's going to create the power vacuum that the Antichrist is going to step right into and that's when he'll have global world power. But what must first happen before that Ezekiel 38 war, or more specific, before the tribulation period begins? The rapture of the church. Now, let me ask you, let me ask you, if we're watching Russia and their aggression, if we're watching the developments of Ukraine, if we are watching Iran and Turkey and Libya, and if we are watching these things, the stage is being set, then does that mean the rapture of the church is the next event on God's prophetic calendar? Could it be that we are that close to Christ coming? Friends, it's where everything is leading. Now, let me ask this question and all will begin to work my way, we'll begin to land the plane here. You can put your trays in their upright position and make sure your seatbelts are fastened because we are beginning our descent. Have you learned anything today? Amen. Say, Chad, what does all this have to do with the Bible? Everything. Everything. Because let me tell you what the Bible says you and I ought to be doing. It says we ought to be longing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're watching things play out like never before. And whereas Satan would want you to be paralyzed in fear, God wants us to move forward in faith. Amen. God wants us to purify ourselves. God wants us to be sober in our daily lives. God wants us to be watching and waiting, eager for his return. God wants us to be praying even so Come quickly, Lord. But see, here's the thing. For many of us, our hearts feel divided. While one side of our hearts says, come quickly, Lord, the other side of our hearts says, but God, what about my children? What about my prodigals? What about the people that I love? Many that I have talked to Express they are not fearful so much about world events. They're not fearful so much even about the return, the imminent return of the Lord. What they're fearful about is what will happen to their loved ones after Christ comes. Well, let me tell you what I believe that will happen. They tell me this morning that this building is so full that there are about 15 available seats is what they tell me. Apparently, the place is packed today. Yeah, that's a good thing. Amen. Come on, Fort Henry Drive. Amen. Moving on up to the east side. Is it, wouldn't it be cool if it really was the east part of the Is it? I don't know. Somebody needs to tell me that. A deluxe apartment in the sky. Amen. Hallelujah. But let me tell you, when this church will be far beyond capacity. It will be immediately after the rapture of the church that all of our loved ones who we tried so hard to share with them the truth and they would not receive it, they'll know in that instant what is going on and they will flood to this church and every gospel preaching church. Churches will never see full capacity like after the rapture of the church. I don't know who's going to, I vote Pastor Josh stay behind for that. Does anybody, can I get an I? Can we go ahead and just, we'll just motion carried. Amen. Pastor Josh will be our tribulation pastor. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Thank you. We'll leave cash only for you. <laughs> Many of you have prodigals in your life. And you're saying, Chad, 
How do I get my family rapture ready? Let me encourage you in this. Don't waste any opportunities. Share with your loved ones. Now, the Holy Spirit will show you the right way to do it. Don't do it your way because you'll mess it up. Do it God's way. For some people, you need to be very gentle. For some, you need to answer very sincere questions. For others, you need to snatch them out of the fire. That means you get in their face. Everybody's different. Everyone's different. And you need to know how to approach different approaches with others. But take advantage of your opportunities to share the gospel with them. But let me tell you, number two, if I were you, and I've thought about this, even with our own congregation, I've thought, you know, we need, we need somewhere easy to find that gives answers. Here's what's coming next. Because you know what the Bible teaches? Tribulation saints. There are going to be untold numbers of people born again during the tribulation. Uh, you know, some churches, I believe, erroneously teach that if anyone's heard the gospel, they can't be saved during the tribulation. I don't see that anywhere in the scriptures. Uh, why would God seal the 144,000 to preach the gospel if people weren't going to be saved? There'll be unbelievable amounts of people saved, but oh, what a price that they will ultimately pay for living for Jesus during the tribulation period. None of, we don't want any of our loved ones left. As a matter of fact, on December 3rd, Lord willing, I plan to preach a message called Household Salvation. And the rest of December, we're going to focus on prodigals. December 10th, Lord willing, will be the lost sheep. December 17th, the lost coin. And December 24th, Christmas Sunday, the lost prodigal. If you have prodigals in your life, I plead with you, get them here Christmas morning. Get them here because we're going to present the gospel in a powerful way. Perhaps you're listening today, whether you're in the building or you're listening online, and you're not ready for the rapture. Your life isn't right with God. Friends, I'm asking you, evaluate your life today. Christ is coming soon. 2,600 years ago, God showed us the alignment of events. And if you pull up Fox, CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post, The Blaze, any of that, pull any of them up. You're going to watch the stage literally be set before your very eyes. You know why? Because God keeps his word. And today, if you're playing church, today, if you've got one foot in and one foot out, I wouldn't miss the rapture of the church for anything in this world. Did you hear me? For nothing worldly. Take your worldliness and forsake it. Take your worldliness, walk away from it. Take your sin and utterly abandon it. Take the distractions of your life, get rid of them. And let a seriousness, that's what the scriptures mean, be sober-minded. Let a seriousness settle in over your life and over your faith like never before. Because I'm telling you, church, Christ is coming. Are you ready? Is your family ready?